so it's a great pleasure to have Professor Cleek Burgess uh, from the Department of Physics and Astronomy, McMaster University, and he is also uh, uh, associated with Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics Canada, and uh, uh, it's a, a, a great pleasure to have him in our forum. This is 23rd talk uh, in the series, and uh, we are very happy to have him. Uh, he works on many, many things, quantum field theories, uh, uh, different aspects of particle physics, including cosmology, particle physics connection. And recently he's started, uh, like uh, not very recently, but he's working on this open quantum field theories, its applications and a uh, lot of stuffs. And uh, today he will speak about the uh, uh, prospects of effective field theories. So the title of his talk is Scaling the Landscape, Robust Effective Field Theory Implications from Ultraviolet Physics. So uh, Cliff, uh, you can start uh, from your end. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for that kind introduction. I'm just gonna pause and turn my timer on here so that I'll know roughly how long I have left. Uh, I'm aiming for about an hour. And as you said, please do interrupt with questions. Uh, as you'll see, it's not eloquent prose you're gonna get, so it, interruptions won't hurt it. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to, um, the topic is, um, as in the title, the Scaling the Landscape. What it really is, is it's, uh, it's a bit of a, it's gonna start with a bit of a polemic against uh, the swampland. And, and, and the, the broader issue is, um, I think that there's a, people are asking the, these days, um, people are asking, what can, what can we learn? You know, we seem to be in a situation where uh, we're at a, looking at the low energy limit of some very, um, some fundamental theory at a much higher energies, and, and we can disagree on what that fundamental theory might be. Um, I'm gonna take the point of view here that it's string theory, mostly just because string theory is the theory that's developed to the point where you can ask a lot of these questions very crisply. But in principle, everything I'm gonna say, I think, or much of what I will say, I think should apply to uh, other alternatives at the EV. But people are asking, are there things, what, what can we learn about, uh, about what's going on in nature and, and in particular, what's going on at very high energies in nature, uh, given we only have a low energy access to it. And part of that story in the last several years has involved what's called the swampland. And um, I personally uh, think that the swampland is a not very fruitful direction to go. And I'd like to make the case for what a better direction is in this talk. And that's, that's more or less the main message. And it'll touch on uh, string theory, and please ask questions, because I'm not sure what the background of the audience is. Uh, please do ask questions if I'm using things um, that need more explanation, because I'm happy to do that. So the, 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 the nice thing is that the story ends with, I think that there's, uh, the story I'm gonna tell you is not completely hypothetical, but I think there's actually experimental indications that this picture I'm trying to sell to you uh, has something going for it, that there's this, this things that you, the few places we can test it, it seems to actually uh, do exactly what observations uh, are asking. And that has implications as well for the observations. So the two parts of the story are summarized in these two papers that are listed in the top here. Um, the first one, the, 19, the 2016 one is, is to do with more of the observational implications for cosmology. And the later one is the one that is uh, the symmetry story that I'm gonna be mostly focused on. I should also apologize uh, for referencing in this talk. I, there's gonna be very, you're seeing basically the last references in the talk. And so I will largely not be giving citations as I go along because many, many people have contributed. I've also come to realize uh, as we've moved to online talks, how much I relied on being on airplanes and in hotels to do that kind of thing to finish the talks and polish them. But um, <laughs> half the time, yeah, because of this, I'm gonna ha half the time not be setting myself either. So I'll suffer as much as, as, I, as I benefit, but uh, please don't assume that everything I'm telling you is coming from these two papers. Uh, I'll try to remember to say 
along the way. And, uh, and, and please remind me if you think of, uh, I'm missing something that needs to be emphasized. Okay, so let me start with a preamble and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you the table of contents. So, so the, the preamble is, is that we, we have the situation where we think that there's fundamental physics going on at very high energies, and yet we only have experimental access to much lower energies, and that's the natural, that's, a, that's the situation which has actually been common in the history of science. And what makes everything work uh, and allows us to make progress is really the fact of decoupling. It's a fact, the decoupling is a statement that most long distance physics doesn't really depend much on the details of short distance physics. And it's a fact, just, it just, it's just true for nature that, that if you ask about the properties of atoms, you didn't need to know much about nuclear physics in order to make detailed properties about atoms. You need to know some things like the charge of the nucleus or the mass of the nucleus, but you don't need to know most of the details. It's also a fact of our theoretical framework that quantum field theories share this property which is a huge success of quantum field theory. And um, effective field theories are just the efficient expression of that fact that, that short distances are decoupling from long distances. And throughout science, that decoupling has been good news in the sense that it means that you can make reliable predictions at low energies. You don't need to worry that your predictions of how trajectories of rockets are, gonna, are moving in the solar system depends somehow, it could change dramatically if all of a sudden we get a new theory of quantum gravity at the Planck scale. It means that the, although we're ignorant of high energies, much of what we predict is, doesn't matter uh, what, that, what's going on at high energies. And so it doesn't matter that we're ignorant. Where it becomes bad news is if you think you know what's going on at high energies and you're trying to test it because the same thing that makes predictions robust means that um, most predictions are hidden from the details that you think you know and you'd like to verify. And so, so much of the story in this talk is going to be about you know, what can we do with that? How, how do we, following along the swampland proposals, and, in, and earlier than that, just, just in general, how do we, ex if you think you have a theory of, at high energies, as string theorists do and, and others do, then um, what's your strategy to, what should your strategy be to overcome this, this decoupling restriction? Now, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, sorry. Yeah. So, just to make, make it all concrete, the you know, quantum chromodynamics is the classic example of this. It's the poster child of how these things go. And it famously has very, fa you know, very robust and well-established uh, predictions for pions at low energies, the soft pion theorems, uh, which are experimentally verified. And that's the laboratory in which a lot of the effective field theory techniques were developed. And uh, what's good about those predictions, you know, that you make those predictions even though the People haven't solved QCD. It's it's a complicated theory, and there's lots of strong coupling dynamics. And what happens in the, in these predictions is that the the properties of pions at low energies are really special cases of the properties of Goldstone bosons at low energies. And if you have any theory at high energies which shares the symmetry breaking pattern that QCD has, so for example, SU two cross SU two breaks to SU two, then you're going to get the same soft pion theorems basically. And so that shows that. Um, Another way of phrasing this double-edged sword story is that uh, uh, organizing things in terms of scales tells you that uh, there are different kinds of predictions you can make. So that those that are robust, such as the soft pion theorems in QCD, which are really relying only on general properties like the particle content and the symmetries of the full theory. And then, so those are robust in the sense that they're very reliable. They don't depend on the details much. But if you want to learn about the details, you're more interested in uh, what you might call UV-sensitive observables. Where, uh, and in QCD, an example of that might be you know, calculating the value of the pion mass or the proton mass or, or something which is uh, less of a symmetry property and more of a specific dynamical property of QCD. And I'd like to focus on the, the, those two kinds of predictions uh, in cosmology and, 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 and coming from, from string theory in, in particular, but in, from UV uh, complete physics of, of, gra of gravity. So that's the distinction I'd like you to have in mind in what, where, where, in what follows. So um, another thing, since I'm going to be talking about uh, string theory in particular, uh, along the way I'd like to just say some points which are, will not play such a huge role in the talk, but which I think come up in the conversations often, and uh, which I'd like to kind of say something about at the very beginning. Uh, one is that uh, you often, uh, sometimes 
particularly string theorists, think about effective field theories as the thing you do if you can't do anything else. And so in that sense, it's a poor man's tool. And that if you really understand it, then you'll have some sort of a fundamental uh, understanding in terms of what's going on at 10 dimensions or in whatever your string uh, detailed theory is. And I'd like to emphasize that actually that's not the way science has ever worked. And, 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 and there are examples uh, within the science that we already understand uh, that shows you that that's not true. And so the analog of that point of view would have been the point of view that we can't really calculate the QCD scale because we don't really know for sure that quarks are not composite and that we don't really know that the, those are the degrees of freedom we should be calculating all of our normalization group uh, predictions with. Those are really irrelevant uh, statements in the sense that, uh, that uh, the, the physics of the QCD scale and hundreds of, MEV, hundreds of MEV or the GEV scale, really the details of the substructure of quarks is decoupled at that point. And it's actually, it's not that you're just doing the best you can when you work at low energies, it's actually the right thing to do. It's the efficient way to calculate the predictions of any theory at high energies for which quarks are as composite as they appear to be experimentally, uh, for which the absence of evidence for compositeness is as good as it is for the quarks we see in nature. Sometimes in this kind of a conversation, uh, things, uh, issues of technical naturalness come up and, uh, and, and those are particularly um, of interest now because in the story of trying to understand what's going on at high energies, uh, one of the guidelines in the past has been criterion of, of the criterion of technical naturalness, uh, which was designed as, as, as a, uh, distilling out what features of, of the high energy physics, the things you, know, you need to change in the standard model to uh, make it insensitive to what's going on at high energies. There are some specific things in the standard model that uh, do depend on a high energy physics and they do depend on it in a way which appears not to be generic to low energy, uh, low energy limit of something. And this whole line of argument based on naturalness has been uh, under, under suspicion because uh, many of the things that it predicted for the LHC were not seen. The cosmological constant problem remains a problem and it's at even lower energies and, and it's in energies where, where the electron is the problem and we think we understand the electron very well. So I think that there are rightly uh, people worry about naturalness issues as whether or not those are good uh, clues in nature. Um, but I would like to make two points here. One is to distinguish that from the effective field theory understanding of nature. The naturalness is not something which you need to buy into to buy into uh, the effective field theory description of nature. But I also would say that, that uh, the evidence against naturalness is also not very strong. It's one of those things that I think a lot of very overly strong claims were made in the name of naturalness, which need not be true. I think the cosmological constant problem is really a problem. That's the thing that, uh, until that's understood, it'll be hard to be absolutely sure how useful naturalness is, but uh, I'll have more to say about these things as we go along. So, coming back to the, uh, the main question, you know, we think there are UV completions at the Planck scale, and we think we know what some so examples please, of I them are. I have a question, sorry, sorry yeah, yeah. for the interruption. So yeah. the thing you told, it's basically, kind of a fine tuning issue so uh, like for a, for a physicist how much that is important at present well i would say that that uh, there are people you know, perfectly reasonable people who think that it has not important at all that naturalness is is irrelevant that that you have parameters you learn them from experiment and that's the end of it and 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 the the issue you know the the essence of technical naturalness is that uh, but a technical, there's many things that are called naturalness and some of them are just aesthetics. And I, I, I agree that those are not really so important, but the, the issue I think is that the fundamental one is technical naturalness, which I take to, I define to be, uh, if you have a small parameter in nature, a small dimensionless parameter, that you can understand its smallness at any scale that you t choose to ask the question. Because that's the way that, for instance, the hierarchy between the size of an atom and a nucleus is understood now. You can ask the question of why, the, why that small in the standard model where it's to do with the smallness of the fine structure constant and the electron mass compared to the QCD scale. You can ask it in the effective theory where you've integrated out the QCD and so it's now protons and neutrons. But in all cases, the small parameter is small so that there's an understanding everywhere you choose to ask the question. And, and all the hierarchies that we know in nature that we really understand, that's the way it works. What would be not natural would be if a small parameter that's measured at low energies turns out to be a huge parameter at high energies and there's just a very specific value that it has, which runs to the small value that you measure. That's a logically possible thing because no one measures the parameter at high energy. So, so there's, there's nothing logically inconsistent with saying that naturalness is irrelevant. 
but it, it's radical in the sense that every hierarchy we know in nature, except for the, you know, the two that are a puzzle, and really there's only one that's a real puzzle, I think the cosmological constant problem. Uh, every other example is, is natural, and so it's a, it's a strong statement to say that uh, that practice, what's been true for all hierarchies in the past is no longer true for these specific ones. So I think at the end of the day, it's up to your answer your question. You know, there's there's there's, there's it's a it's a, I think it's a question of how you choose to organize your time as opposed to uh, the people who don't agree that naturalness is an important criterion. They're not necessarily wrong. It's a, a question is is it fruitful to organize your thinking that way? And I think it's a legitimate point to say that in the past we spent a lot of time organizing that way and it has not been that fruitful. So that's a fair criticism. Uh, can I, should I go on? Yeah, please. Okay. All right. So, so coming to the, the question of, of, so what can we learn about the fact that we think we do have some idea of what UV physics might look like at the Planck scale? I'm old enough that I remember then that when that wasn't true, there was a time when people used to say, if you take any theory with gravity, it used to be thought of as being a wonderful thing that, that renormalizable theories emerge at low energies. That explains why renormalizable theories are so important in nature. So what we need to do with gravity is just write down the class of things involving gravity that are renormalizable, and then that'll be a, a limited set of the possible theories of gravity, and those are the ones we should look at. And the problem was that that was the empty set at that point. But now, you know, since the 80s, we've had concrete examples where we think the things that an ultraviolet complete theory, uh, or even a renormalizable theory at the Planck scale would have to satisfy, uh, are satisfied, and, and in the example of string theory, it's better than renormalizable. It's just, it seems to be ultraviolet complete in the sense that there's, it, renormalizability would be a statement that you understand the Planck scale, but you can ignore things that are high, happening at, at even higher energies. Whereas in string theory, what happens is it's just really true that it's consistent to think there is nothing at higher energies except for string theory, that that's the last, the last word in what's happening. So the fact that the examples exist is, is, is actually amazing in itself for someone who's, who's my age. And so that's one thing we learn is that uh, we're not talking about the empty set when we talk about the complete uh, ultraviolet complete versions of gravity. But what people have focused on more recently, I think has been, uh, uh, the, the motivation has been good, that the things that we would like to see at low energies, like the standard model particle content or uh, dark matter or, or, or you know, close to the sitter phases of the universe, if you're interested in either dark uh, energy or in, in uh, inflation, uh, all of those things seem to be difficult to get in concrete examples. Uh, here I'm thinking of string theory specifically. Um, and so the thinking is that might be telling us something. It might be telling us that uh, they're not so difficult to get. They're not so easy to get always, but if it's not crazy. It's not that hard to get them uh, if you just write down some random effective field theory at low energies. Uh, but it might be, there might be that there's information in the observation that those things are hard to get from a string point of view or a UV complete point of view. And that takes people or has taken people uh, to the swampland hypothesis where the, 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 the assertion that gets distilled out of that observation that some things are hard to get is that maybe the situation is that there are some effective field theories that look like they make sense in themselves but which uh, don't have a completion at high energy. So they, you can't get them from some sensible high energy theory. And normally the people who say this have in mind something like string theory as what that high energy theory might be. Um, and I wanna argue against, I wanna argue that actually there is information in the, in, the, in, in the fact that these various things like the sitter solutions are scarce, but it, this is not the information that uh, I think that uh, I don't see any evidence at all that, that uh, low energy effective field theories that make sense cannot be completed to ultraviolet completions. And all of the examples, and this is a separate talk, you know, if someone asks, I can talk about it more, but, but uh, the examples that people quote as being the examples of this uh, absence of UV completions, I don't see as being that. I th think that the, what they do is there's typically in the full theory and the low energy theory, there's some parameter, and for some values of those parameters, uh, the theory is sensible, for the, uh, some other values, it's not sensible. And what happens is that the low energy limit of the nonsensical parameter is a is a effective field theory with a nonsensical parameter, and so there's no examples there that I can see of a, a, a effective field theory that makes perfect sense for which you know that there cannot be a UV completion, and so it's logically possible that's the way it works. But I think it's not a very fruitful way to go, and that there's not a lot of evidence. It's being built on a very thin ice 
uh, of evidence. What I'd like to argue is that the things that we're looking at really are much more the, what you would find in a traditional way of thinking about things, that the comparison that should be made with string theory is not to all possible effective field theories, it's to the effective field theories that contain the symmetries of string theory. And so you would not have tested, you would have not have drawn conclusions about QCD by comparing it to all sorts of random field theories that do not share the symmetry properties of the Goldstone bosons, for example. You really are interested in comparing QCD to the low energy theories which share the robust symmetry properties of the UV completion. And what's informative is comparing those two things, not comparing them to other random things that have different uh, symmetry properties. And so I want to argue that the things that are remarkable, that it seem to be difficult to get at low energies, are really consequences of very robust symmetries of perturbative strings. And that's what we're looking at. And, and, and once you see things that way, that suggests, it tells you what you need to do to find the things you're looking for, uh, because you, you know what you're fighting. And much of the progress in this area, I think, has been in, in practice, even if they not, wouldn't have phrased it this way, has been because of this, this uh, way of thinking about things. So with that background, and I know that took a little while, uh, here's where I, uh, I'd like to tell you. I'd, I'd like to tell you that the basic symmetries I think we're looking at are scaling symmetries, approximate scaling symmetries. And so I'll tell you kind of in, in more detail what those are. Uh, and because it's not scaling, it's not literally scale invariance, but it's, uh, there's, there's accidental approximate scaling symmetries that are, are generic in, in, I think, uh, perturbative string theories, and I think more generally uh, in UV completions for which you have perturbative expansion parameters. Uh, it tends to be best understood in string theory in a supersymmetric language, and, and I, so I'll, I'll ask kind of what scaling symmetries, these approximate scaling symmetries, what they mean for supersymmetry, and you'll see that they imply, uh, among other things, no scale models, which have been things, that, the class of supersymmetries which have been recognized to have uh, unusual properties and also to be unusually prevalent amongst the low energy description of supersymmetric theories. Uh, I'm going to mention a specific uh, mechanism for naturalness, which is something which has emerged in string theory, but I think the low energy understanding of it uh, comes from these symmetries. And, uh, and I think there's the new thing here will be just be to provide that low, en low energy understanding. And then I want to argue that these scale invariances I'm talking about really, uh, they nail what, what the inflationary uh, observations about from, what observations of primordial fluctuations seem to be telling us. And so the, I think that this class of models is a is a not very well explored class, um, because the m much of the lesson of low energy has focused too much on a specific subclass of the kinds of things you get at low energy, and the subclass that has been focused on does not include the information of scale invariance, which I think is what makes these models successful. So, so uh, one yeah. uh, before going, I just want to ask, like. Uh, uh, I can understand that why you are considering 4, 4D SUSI, but is it uh, the usual n equal to one or higher supersymmetries you will consider? N equals one. Oh, okay. They're pretty much exclusively yellow. I think there's a similar statement you can make for higher supersymmetries because what I'm going to argue is that the symmetry I'm going to argue for coming from perturbative uh, UV physics is going to turn into a class. Part of the evidence that's there is that the uh, 10 dimensional and higher dimensional supergravities, they all have the scale invariance. So even if you didn't think it was a principle coming from string theory, it's just true that higher dimensional supergravities have these things. And so their dimensional reductions, including the ones that have more than one supersymmetry in four dimensions, also have these scale invariances. But I'm gonna focus on the N equals one just because those are the ones that are the phenomenologically interesting ones. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Okay, so, so what is the scaling uh, symmetry I'm talking about? So, so the scaling symmetry, what I'm gonna call a symmetry, is not really a symmetry in the sense of a symmetry of the action, but it's a, a, it's a, it's a symmetry of the classical equations of motion. So it's gonna be broken by effects, including quantum effects. And part of the story will be how badly is it broken. But it will be a property uh, that this, the classical equations of motion, so the leading order in some expansion will have this symmetry by accident. And so what is the symmetry? The symmetry is, the metric and some other fields scale by some constant parameter. And when that happens, the leading part of the action scales in a specific way. So as in the equations here, I think you can see my mouse. Yeah. So, so as in the, the, here are the scaling laws for the fields, and then here's what the action does. And although the action is not invariant unless W is the, the, the weight W is zero, 
uh, for any W, the equations of motion will be invariant because if the action scales, then a solution to the equations of motion where d s d phi vanishes will go to another solution under these transformations. That's why they're powerful. So uh, the I apologize for the picture. I was just looking for pictures that have scaling in it, and that's one of the things that Google brought up. <laughs> so it's uh, not so relevant to what I'm going to say, but it's a picture. So uh, so the point is that in string theory, and probably very likely true in, in, in UV completions of gravity in general, the main observation is that there are no parameters. When you're doing a perturbative expansion, you're not expanding in some parameter in the Lagrangian. What you're really doing is you're expanding in some field. And so the, the things that we think of as parameters, like the fine structure constant or the Newton constant, those are really the, the expectation values of fields. And so in the end of the day, in string theory, what you're doing when you're in the perturbative limit, right, and that perturbative limit could mean low energy limit. It could mean the weak coupling limit or both of them. I'm going to imagine both of them. That's why I'm going to have two fields. But you're basically, the statement about perturbative expansions is that you're really doing an expansion of the action and powers of the fields. And so you can kind of see that in the con that context, the kind of scaling transformations I was talking about are going to be generic. That any fixed order in that expansion, so the first line here is showing the action expanded in powers of two fields, phi and psi. If I have terms like that, if I focus on any one term in that series, it's going to have automatically the property that if I scale the fields phi and psi by some power, then the specific term in the action, any specific term in the action will scale in some specific way. And in particular, most importantly, the leading term will scale in some specific way. Subleading terms will scale in a different but specific way. But by asking how things scale, I'm going to be able to identify uh, they're saying what order in the expansion of phi and psi we're in is the same thing as telling you how those terms scale, if I tell you precisely what the scaling rules are. So there's lots of evidence. So that, please, uh, here, yeah. this lambda, is it a global parameter or the local parameter? Global, yeah, it's, it's a constant. So it's, it really is a, it's not a gauge transformation. Oh, okay. So think of it as a rigid scale transformation, yeah. And so, so the... Uh, so what's the evidence of what I'm telling you? It's, it's, it's a very plausible argument I just gave you, but if it's true, it should be true, should just be true. If I look at all the low energy limits of string theory, uh, where in every single one of them, there's an expansion parameter going on, at the very least you're doing the low energy expansion normally. Uh, I, it should just be, just be that these scaling transformations are there. So I, the next few slides are just showing you that that's true. I'm not gonna show you all the examples. We went through all the various 10 dimensional examples. I'm gonna show you two examples just because they're informative. So the first one is 11-dimensional uh, supergravity. That's normally thought of as being a, a strongly coupled vacuum in string theory. So it, it should not have a perturbative expansion in the string coupling, but it does have a low energy expansion. And the low energy expansion should have, a, that that's associated with the metric in the end of the day. And so it, there should be a scaling. If, I, if what I'm telling you is true, there should be a scale invariance of the 11-dimensional supergravity. And here it is. If you just take the metric and you scale it in the way that's indicated in the, in the box, you take the three form field and scale it this way, you scale the fermions in some way that I'm not telling you, but there exists a way you can scale them. Then the whole uh, two derivative pieces of the action in 11 dimensional supergravity scales in this particular way. And that's the reflection that that came to you from some ultraviolet complete theory where you did a low energy expansion. And that's why you kept the two derivative parts of the Lagrangian in 11 dimension. Uh, the higher than two derivative parts don't scale in this way, but they scale in the way which is consistent with the order in the alpha prime expansion that you go. Alpha prime here for people that are not string theorists is just really alpha prime is one over the string scale squared. The string spectrum tends to have a characteristic size, which is to do with the tension of the string. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's a tower of states that are spaced by the string scale. And alpha prime is one over that string mass scale squared. And so the alpha prime expansion is just code for the low energy expansion compared to that basic string scale. <coughs> Uh, if you look at perturbative vacua, which are ones for which the string coupling is weak, then there should be an additional scaling because you still have the low energy expansion, but you will also now have the perturbative expansion. And that's also true. If you go to the 10-dimensional vacua, all of them, the 2B, the 2A, the, two, uh, um, the, the, the type 1 and the heterotic, they all have two scaling symmetries for free when you look at those the corresponding Lagrangians. And... Um, and so he, and here it is for type 2b that's the one i'm going to look at mostly uh, because that's the one about which most is known but if you scale the metric in this way then the various fields in this following way and i'll tell you more about what these fields are in a second then you see that there are two powers here there's a, what i'm calling u and w 
And the fact that means that there are two independent uh, free parameters in the problem, uh, which are another way of saying that there's two independent uh, scale transformations you can do uh, that leave the action invariant. And so you do this kind of a transformation where uh, U and W are arbitrary, basically, parameters, then the uh, 10 dimensional Lagrangian scales in this specific way. And the fields that I told you I was going to say more about are related to the basic fields in this way. So tau is, you know, the C's are the various Ramon Ramon fields. These are the anti symmetric tensor fields. The dilaton is the thing that e to the phi in my conventions will be the string coupling constant. That's the field that's describing the weak coupling. So the imaginary part of tau is the thing that knows about the uh, string, uh, weak coupling and string theory. And this G three form field strength is the D of the two form uh, field strength C plus tau times the uh, D of the, the other two form field strength. Uh, the, this is the, the, the Niva Schwartz uh, two form field. And so um, I'm, I'm kind of emphasizing this combination of var variables just because uh, these are the ones that uh, man there's, a, there's a symmetry, an accidental symmetry that happens in 10 dimensional supergravity, an SL2R transformation under which tau transforms in this way, where A, B, C, and D are arbitrary real numbers satisfying A, D minus B, C is one, and G transforms in this way. And I, I just tell you that because I'm going to refer to that in a second. I'm not sure if you have a question that uh, a video came on here. So, Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm Sudhakar from Niger, Bhubaneswar. I'm just wondering, uh, I'm from, I'm from India, Sudhakar Panda, I'm from India. Yeah. I just have a question. Uh, in this 10, dimen 10 dimensional supergravity context, what is alpha prime and GS? Alpha prime and GS we'll talk about in the string theory context, but pure 10 dimensional supergravity, where is my parameter alpha prime and GS? Yes, they're, 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 it depends on how you write them, but the way they were traditionally written, the, the 10 dimensional supergravity, for example, has a, a Planck scale, which is the Newton's constant in 10 dimensions. Yeah. And that's one combination of alpha prime and GS. And okay. another combination is coming in, in in some of the other places in the Lagrangian. And and what's the reason uh, it depends on how you write things is that the statement that uh, there's no parameters in string theory is the statement that I can absorb GS into the dilaton so that I can yeah. write it in such a way as the GS doesn't appear to be there anymore. That's and right. That I, can do that, that I can do in the string theory low energy context. But yes. suppose I don't know string theory, but I have a 10 dimensional supergravity theory, which we knew that we had earlier before string theory came into picture. We had a 10 dimensional supergravity. How do I introduce their alpha prime and GS expansion? Well, the way you do it is that, uh, this is kind of the way it actually happened, is that, uh, is that the, if you just write down the supergravity, as people did, then you see that there's a scale in the problem, which is uh, what they would call the Planck scale. But you also see that you can scale your fields in such a way that that scale just comes out of the whole Lagrangian. And, uh, and there is no GS because it's just something I could absorb into phi. And then the way that you see that there's an alpha prime expansion, for example, is that the supergravity that people write down only involves two derivatives. Yeah, so but I, I can write that. Okay. So, so it's just a derivative mean, expansion. Alpha prime expansion is basically you are telling derivative expansion. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. And then, and then, and then the GS expansion is, is I would just interpret yes, to be we'll get the, into the dilaton, which is there already in the supergravity theory. Exactly. So the observation there is that the dilaton can be scaled out in front of the whole action, and so it's playing the same role as H bar would have done. So then the, the, you can see it's counting loops. Yeah. But you can kind of see that completely in this in the supergravity by itself. Okay. Thank okay. You. All right. So uh, so these two scale transformations. Uh, one of them is. Uh, you, know, you, you notice that the Lagrangian here only scales in a way that depends on one of them because it only depends on u. The other one then, if I had, had set u equals zero and I kept w not zero, that's a scale transformation that leaves the Lagrangian invariant. And that turns out to be a special case of this SL2R transformations. If I took uh, b equals zero, uh, and, but, but I make a d equals one, so uh, a is one over d, then that's a scaling of tau, and then the other fields do whatever they do. And that is an invariance of the action, is, is what the invariance of SL2R is. And so, so the one way to think about in the type 2 case specifically, the second scale invariance is that it's a special case of SL2R. And, and we know that SL2R gets broken by quantum effects and, uh, and other things. And so part of the story will be, how does it get broken? Now, what's, you know, so why am I emphasizing the scale transformations? 
the scale transformations are really remarkable in, in several ways. And one thing, one way in which they're remarkable is the, they can do things that can't normally be done by symmetries. And so in particular, uh, they can enforce the vanishing of the potential even after they're spontaneously broken, which is unusual. Normally, if you're interested in the cosmological constant problem, uh, if you have a symmetry like supersymmetry that can make the potential zero, as soon as you break the symmetry, then the potential is not zero. And that's not true for scale invariance. So if it, and so, so there's several layers of what I'm gonna tell you here, but if it was true that you could make scale invariance an exact symmetry of your theory, then you would automatically know that the potential is zero uh, at its minimum uh, at some level. And that's not so interesting if the minimum that you're, you arrive at is one for which scale invariance is not spontaneously broken, because if it's not broken, then all masses are zero. And the naturalist problems are to do with the vanishing of the potential energy given that other things are massive, not, there's not a, there's, there is no cosmological constant problem if everybody's massless, basically. So how do you see this as fact? If you basically take this basic property for the potential that, that when I scale the fields, the potential scales in some specific way, uh, and the, the fact that it scales is normally to do with the fact that the metric is also scaling and there's a root G in front of the potential. Um, then if you just differentiate this several times with respect to lambda and with respect to the fields, then you can derive these two equations on the right here. Uh, as, as consequences of this equation on the left. And the first one on the right is telling you that uh, if you find a place where the derivative of the potential vanishes, then that will be a place where, where the potential itself vanishes unless the spread weight W also vanishes. So this star in then is there's an exception that if W vanishes, then you can't draw this conclusion, but otherwise it's generic. And it's also true, this equation shows you that if you find a solution where phi is equal to zero, that is to say, that's the scale invariant point. That's where all the, the fields are, are vanishing. So they, under scale transformations, they're left invariant. Then it, this equation tells you that if phi is zero, then what's left has to vanish too. And that says that, that unless P is equal to W, then the derivative of, of V with respect to phi is also zero. So that says that if you have a scale invariant point, it will automatically be a solution to your potential. It'll be a, a, a stationary point. And it's always true that if you have any solution, the potential will vanish at that solution. So that says that uh, if you are interested in spontaneously breaking scale invariance, you always have to be doing it uh, with a flat direction. So this is a picture of what the potential would look like. If there's a point here uh, that is, if you can find a point where some fields are not zero, uh, so that's what you would mean by scale, uh, breaking scale invariance spontaneously, then it'll always be true that if I scale, if I do a scale transformation of this, that will also be a solution, but all the solutions will have exactly zero potential. And so that there, there'll have to be a flat direction along that direction. And the reason that zero is kind of simple to see because un, you know, what's different about scale transformations compared to internal symmetries is if you had a Mexican hat potential for an internal symmetry, you're used to the fact that the potential is flat along the bottom, but the place where the symmetry is not broken is at the top of the hill, not at the bottom. And so those two things are not connected to each other. But in scale transformations, the scale invariant point is a special case of the scale breaking points where I just scale by zero. And so what's happening in the scale breaking situation is that the, the flat direction along the bottom is, is actually connected to this, the invariant point. And the invariant point had to be zero because there's no scales there. And so that's why there's more information in the scale breaking case. So in particular, <coughs> if this were, was a symmetry, it would forbid the sitter space and anti sitter space because it's, there's no scales in the problem the potential has to be zero. And I'm, gonna, I'm, argu I'm, I'm basically arguing that the reason it's hard to get to sitter space is, uh, is exactly this observation that you're starting from a place which is scale invariant. And so it doesn't wanna have to sitter space. You can get any to sitter space. And that's to do with if you break scale invariance, but you don't break supersymmetry by very much, then that'll allow you to have any to sitter solution. So those are more commonly found because we know more about it. so supersymmetric solutions that are not scale invariant. The thing you have to do to get a sitter solution is to break scale invariance by, uh, say, less than the supersymmetry breaking, or or to break them both badly, and and it really we're we're kind of comparatively ignorant about that, but it should be true that the thing that you're going to need to have in these equations to get a sitter solution will be something which sees the breaking of the scale invariance somehow. So, the key question in all these things is always: uh, Do quantum corrections? Uh, Protect it, sorry. Um, my clock is gonna die here. Why is it not? Oh, that's okay, I got another clock, so. 
So the next slide is about, uh, you know, this observation I've, I've made about scale invariance is uh, people made back in the 80s. And this is a case where I should cite people, you know, Christoph Federer, for example, was uh, in the 80s making models along those lines. And it was kind of, they were very well motivated models. And um, the, there's two problems with them from the point of view of the solving naturalness problems. One of them is, is, is that the, we're not talking about a symmetry. If the action is scaling by an amount where W is not zero, then quantum corrections will break that symmetry. The, not in some arbitrary way, but they'll break them by having scaling in a way which is a different power of lambda. But it's worse than that. And, and this is a, the, a Weinberg's no-go theorem. So in response to this, these, these scale breaking models, Weinberg made the observation that if you break supersymmetry or you break scale invariance, you'll generate a potential. It won't be flat anymore. But even if you don't break scale invariance, you'll also generically generate a potential. So Weinberg's point was that if you, even if you assume that scale invariance is not broken by any of the quantum effects, so it really is an exact symmetry, the problem is that the scale invariance does not forbid you having a, like a lambda phi to the fourth potential where there's only one minimum. You have to have a scale invariant point has to be a super, it has to be a minimum or an extremum, but that doesn't have to be, there's nothing that says there has to be more than that. And so the gen generic, generic danger in these models is scale invariant quantum corrections can also lift the flat direction and lead you, uh, uh, and although you'll know that the potential vanishes at the minimum, it'll be doing it in a trivial way where you don't break scale invariance. So there's well-known objections to using these uh, scale invariance arguments to solve naturalist problems. So uh, that discussion kind of suggests thinking about supersymmetry because supersymmetry is, is, is very good at keeping flat directions flat. It's, it's perfectly good if you don't break supersymmetry, but if, it does, if you do break supersymmetry, you can get uh, non-flat directions or flat directions that, don't, uh, that break supersymmetry. And then it becomes a quantitative question about uh, the interplay between the, the different symmetry breaking scales as uh, if you're trying to figure out how big the lifting of a flat direction could be. So I'd like to focus now on, on now n equals one supersymmetry in four dimensions and ask what extra information do you get if you have these kind of scale invariances going on uh, in, in your four dimensional theory. So to set that up for, for those that are not uh, super, you know, haven't been using supergravity recently, uh, the, the, uh, the efficient way to write down the uh, four dimensional Lagrangian that's got one supersymmetry at the two derivative level involves three functions. Uh, what's called the Kähler function depends on here the, here the Z is the, is the, are the scalar fields in your problem, which naturally come in a complex uh, way in supersymmetric theories. Um, and so the Kähler function is a function of, of the, the fields and their complex conjugates. And there's two holomorphic functions, the superpotential and the gauge kinetic terms. And they kind of appear in this supersymmetric way of writing the action. Uh, this curly F is the gauge kinetic field strength. And then the, the potential will be hidden in, in, in W, the superpotential. This field phi is called the compensator field. It's just a, a convenient way of, uh, of thinking about supergravity is to think of it in terms of uh, a broken conformal invariant supergravity. And that'll be a very efficient way to think about the uh, writing of the action in this language that I'm using where, where scale invariance is the property you're trying to follow because this is a natural language for expressing that. So the question is, uh, what can you say about these functions K, W, and F? Uh, if, you, if you say what those functions are, you've said what the theory is, and what implications does scale invariance have for those theories? And the claim is, is going to be that scale invariance is a, basically makes a scaling statement about uh, w and f, but also not k, but e to the minus k over 3, it turns out. Uh, because in this way of writing Lagrangian, that's the combination that's appearing in Lagrangian. So you might imagine that if you're asking the Lagrangian to scale some specific way, then you're asking for these various functions appearing in the, in the yellow box to scale in a specific way, and that's basically true. The way that those functions appear in the actual uh, you know, implications of the Lagrangian are, are in this way, that the k, the two derivatives of k, subscripts here mean differentiation. So this is the derivatives with respect to z and respect to z star of k. That gives you the kinetic terms for the scalars. And the potential, or the a part of the potential, comes from uh, this particular combination. So, so these Kähler covariant derivatives of the superpotential are defined in this way. It's, a, it's the ordinary derivative of the superpotential plus the derivative of the Kähler function times the superpotential. That's what D capital D means. And this inverse is k upper ij bar is the matrix inverse of this k lower ij bar. So if you thought of that as being a metric, and this would be the inverse metric. And otherwise, everything else is here is, is, is what it looks like. And uh, the dimensions may look funny, but that's because I'm following the standard supergravity convention where M Planck is one. 
And so uh, this is all in the Planck unit. So there's a hidden one of Rand Planck's. W has, has dimensions of mass cubed, K has dimensions of mass squared. So you can kind of see there's a hidden one of Rand Planck squared in this last term and so on. So what does scale invariance mean for those? Well, if you have a scaling where the fields are scaling in a rigid way, like I've been describing, and if they all scale in the same way, which doesn't have to be true, but which could be true, if it's true that, that, that this e to the minus k over three is a homogeneous degree one function, which is to say that it scales the same way as the fields themselves scaled, then, it's a, 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 then if you differentiate this condition a couple times, you can derive this condition. And that says that if I take the inverse Kähler metric and, and multiply it by the derivatives of k with respect to z and z star, then this particular contraction equals three. That's the consequence of this statement. And the three is coming basically from that three. <clears throat> it turns out that models for which this property is true were discovered in the 80s and they were called no scale models. And, there, and there were, people recognized that that's a very special class of supersymmetric models for the following reason. If I go back to that formula for the potential and if I take, if I assume that the potential does not depend on the field Z, and it's just a constant. So that's what this says. Then the formula I gave you before I involved these covariant derivatives, but those are now turning into just that this term is zero and just they involve the derivative of k times w. Uh, and so the potential turns out to be this, and you see that this square bracket is exactly the thing that's vanishing uh, in the scale invariant case. And so that shows you that uh, if you have a no-scale model defined by this condition that k satisfies everything, and if the superpotential does not depend on those variables, then the scalar potential you find will be flat. And you, what you might have thought is that, well, that might, might not be surprising if supersymmetry doesn't break uh, because supersymmetry can make potentials flat, but the, the order parameter for supersymmetry breaking turns out to be these covariant derivatives at the bottom here, dw, and those are not zero if w is not zero. So what was surprising with these models is that they are examples where supersymmetry is broken along this flat direction and scale invariance is broken, but the potential stays zero. And that kind of is, from what I told you, what you might expect from scale invariance as an implication for um, uh, supersymmetry. So the statement here is that scale invariance is a sufficient condition if all the fields scale the same way for no scale models, which are known to have these flat potentials, which should not be a surprise if they're coming from scale invariance. But the interesting thing it, is, it turns out is that uh, it's a sufficient but not necessary condition. So it turns out that there are many no scale models that are not scale invariant. And the simplest example would be this one. If, e to the minus, if T scales uh, so that uh, E to the minus K over three being linear in T ensures that it's a homogeneous degree one function, if I add an arbitrary function of some other variables that I don't care if they scale or not because it's completely arbitrary, this is still a no scale model, it turns out. It still satisfies that identity when I include these Zs and the Ts amongst the fields that I differentiate. And so it turns out there's these, there's these, these, this, you can identify four uh, nested categories of no-scale models, of which only the category C, the second innermost one, is the standard no-scale definition. That's the one that's defined by this condition on K. The innermost one is, the, is the, the ones that follow from scale invariance. So scale invariance ensures that you're no-scale, but it's not, uh, it's not a necessary condition. It's a sufficient condition. But it turns out there's actually a broader class of uh, the problem of identifying when the potential is flat was solved by Barbieri and others, Ferrara and others in the 80s. And uh, the most general condition is known, and that's condition A, and it contains some subsets. Uh, so there's a very broad class of models which have this flat potential property. Uh, but, and scale invariance is sufficient for them, but it's not necessary. And the reason that's important will be, I'm gonna show you an example where uh, everybody's intuition is that if you make things scale invariant and you hope to get naturalness uh, consequences from it, the expectation is that because scale invariance is not preserved by quantum corrections, that the nice properties of the potential will then also not be surviving quantum corrections. And what happens in the examples I'm gonna show you is that the classical theory is in category D <coughs> and the corrections are no longer scale invariant, but they remain in category C, let's say. And so it can be true that the corrections, although they break scale invariance, they preserve the no scale property. And so they leave the potential flat or very shallow. And so it is true, to answer the question I started off with, that uh, scale invariance together with supersymmetry can have better naturalness properties than scale invariance itself does or supersymmetry itself does. And so part of the next few slides will be showing you examples of that. So the way I'll show you that is I'll just take, these were found within the context of string theory, 
but I'm hope you're I'm, you're getting the message that the argument is not a specific to string theory argument. It's a, basically it's a scale invariance argument. And so let me take the example of the supergravity that I talked about before, the ten-dimensional two B theories that has many four-dimensional light fields that are typically moduli in the compactification that you do getting from ten dimension to four dimensions. The details of which are not important. Uh, there's a there's many moduli. I'm going to call them T, Z, and there's this function tau, which you remember was the thing that included in it the dilaton, which was the string coupling. And these Zs and the Ts are to do with the uh, moduli of the geometries, the Clavier geometries that are that give you four-dimensional supersymmetry when you compactify. The important thing to know is that the uh, these Ts are the ones that are to do with changing the metric, and so they're related to the volume. And the volume of a Calabi-Yau space, it turns out there's a fairly similar, for, fairly similar simple formula for it. The volume of a Calabi-Yau space is given in terms of uh, a cubic polynomial of, what, of these little t's. And these little t's are the volumes of, uh, Calabi-Yau spaces are six dimensional because you're compactifying from 10 to four dimensions. They have many topologically non-trivial features. And in particular, there's lots of four cycles that are four dimensional subsets of the Calabi-Yau space, which are topologically non-trivial. And the volume of each of those is called T, where the label I, the index on T, is keeping track of which four cycle that you're, keeping, you're, you're, you're following. And there can be many of them in the Calabi-Yau space. There's always a quadratic, a cubic formula for the volume in terms of the volumes of these four cycles. Now, the things, these capital T's that are the fields in four dimensions turn out to be the volumes of, uh, sorry, these little T's were volumes of two cycles, not four cycles, so there's little two-dimensional surfaces. The capital T's, which are going to be, the, turn out to be the fields that are describing four-dimensional scalars in the supergravity, those are the volumes of four cycles, and they're given in terms of the total volume by the derivative with respect to T, and so they're given in terms of the two-cycle volumes in this way. So T has dimensions of length squared, V has dimensions of length to the sixth, and capital T has dimensions of length to the fourth. What's important is that if I scale these capital T's by some constant factor, capital V scales in a very specific way. It scales by the um, three halves power of whatever little t scales by. Good. So now if I go and I ask, what's the supergravity describing these fields? And I ask, I, had, I showed you before, there were some, super, there were some scale invariances of the 10-dimensional Lagrangian. All I have to do now is ask, how do those things act on these fields T, Z, and tau? And this is what they do. Tau is particularly direct because that was already in 10-dimensional theory, but these Ts, you learn how they transform by asking, how does the volume transform? And the volume is built from metric, you know how the metric transforms. And this is what you find, is that the four-dimensional metric transforms in this way, the Zs turn out not to transform at all, these Ts transform in a specific way, but all in the same way, and tau transforms in this way. And the action under that transformation does this. And that's a consequence of how the 10-dimensional action transformed. What's important is that the scale invariance tells you there's two scale invariances. If you're only trying to follow, there's two combinations of these variables, that scale invariance will tell you exactly how it depends. And so uh, the e to the minus k over three, you can predict if all you had in your Lagrangian were t tau and the volume, scale invariance would tell you how the e to the minus k three has to depend on those things. And this is what, it, this is what the answer turns out to be. And then if you have more than those two fields, then everything else can be always combined into a scale invariant combination of variables. And then this co constant A would now be a function of all the invariant combinations of the fields. But what's important is that this power of V that you're told to have here is a homogeneous degree one combination because of if I scale the T's in this way, in this way V scaled by the three halves power. And so two thirds power of V is gonna scale the same way as T does. That guarantees that you're always gonna get no scale models for these T's no matter what the T's are for any calabi space, basically. And so that's kind of why calabi spaces, when you compactify on them, generically have this no-scale property. There are fields that break the scale invariance because you have, in these compactifications, what stabilizes the extra dimensions is you have magnetic field-like things uh, that thread these topologically uh, non-trivial surfaces. And so the elasticity of the brains that, that are in these problems that want to shrink fights the fact that the fluxes that are inside these surfaces forbids them from shrinking. And the balancing of those things is what stabilizes the moduli and, and gives you this potential. And so those magnetic fields uh, break scale invariance generically. And so uh, there's a whole story here, that, which I won't, for lack of time, say uh, anything about unless I'm going to ask, that uh, there's a lot of information in the extra dimensions that you might have thought, how does the four-dimensional theory know about quantization of flux? 
it turns out it knows about it because there are a bunch of four-dimensional space filling pore forms that uh, survive in the four-dimensional theory that don't propagate. And so you normally don't talk about them, but they're there to tell you about the topological information of the extra dimensions and, and how and they're relevant for the understanding how the low energy theory transforms under various symmetries. And uh, so I'll just skip over these things because I can kind of see I'm low on time. But there's a very interesting story here, which is the, if you're a condensed matter physicist and you know about uh, topological order, this is the string analog of that. There's fields in your problem that you keep because they're telling you about how the system responds to topological features if it's set up in a topologically interesting way even though they don't propagate. And so your effective theory contains fields that are not propagating, but it, you would get it wrong without including them. And uh, the same thing happens here. There's a similar story about corrections. Everything I've talked about so far is leading order, but if you wanna go to any particular order in the alpha prime expansion, ex expansion or the string expansion, you just have to choose a different power of, of, of phi and psi, in this case, the alpha prime and the dilaton and they will scale in a, another very specific way. So that means that in the same way I could tell you the leading term, I can tell you what any term is as a function of these two fields, say tau and the volume. And so you get predictions like, uh, if you take a term in the 10 dimensional action involving many powers of these field strengths and many powers of curvature and many powers of dilaton, that scales under these scale transformations this specific way. And if I ask my four dimensional Lagrangian to scale the same way, I learn that it has to depend on these variables in this way. And if you go to all the explicit calculations people have done of alpha prime corrections and string loop corrections to various compactifications, they all agree with this formula. And so uh, we've kind of gone through the exercise of checking them all. And so there's no mystery as to why they're appearing as they do. There's a story about brains here, which I'll skip. Um, but it's a similar story that, that other variables you can include and in a, in a way which is uh, controllable. I told you there's a nationalist uh, story and this is a let, let me just mention that on the on, as I as I skip this these slides uh, this bottom formula here for the uh, e to the minus k over three here it, it, it the dependence on tau and v of this first term is the one that we saw before this is how the classical action scales this next term is how the next correction would have scaled and it has a, a fewer powers of v it turns out that one over v to a power is the thing that is controlling the uh, low energy expansion the alpha prime expansion it makes kind of sense that curvatures, if the volume gets smaller, the curvature is getting larger, and it's the derivative expansion that controls the alpha prime expansion. And so this k term is subdominant to the first term by powers of v, which shows you that it's a higher derivative correction. But the interesting thing is that the, this first term was a no-scale model, as I convinced you, because v to the two-thirds was a homogeneous degree one function. This term is also a no-scale model, even though it's got, it's, it includes a quantum a correction, and that's because uh, Although it's not scale invariant, it's still no scale, and it, it's just it's no scale is, is not necessary to be scale invariant. And so there are many examples of this type where if you do the volume expansion, uh, people expected to find that flat directions of the potential get lifted, and they don't get lifted because the first correction to the, although the Kähler function gets corrected, it turns out that that correction does not uh, percolate through the, the, the potential because you're still in the no scale category. And so this mechanism whereby corrections can be smaller than you think is uh, something which has not been exploited, I don't think, in four-dimensional models very carefully. So here's the, the original scale invariant no-scale theory. Here's the correction to it in powers of one over phi. It's still no-scale by accident. And the first correction that sees the fact that you're not no-scale and so gives you a non-trivial potential and so gives you corrections to the masses and the vacuum energy is appearing uh, at, at, at lower order than you think or at higher order than you think it should have done naively. So let me kind of skip to the final thing in the last few seconds, because uh, I see that I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, I told you at the very beginning that there's- oh, you a, that there's time. you can continue. Oh, is that right? Okay, so, okay. so, the, the, so this part is the part that uh, I think is probably the most uh, practical application of those observations. And that is that, um, you know, if you believe that inflation, I've, I've kind of tried to argue for you that the sitter space is kind of hard to get from, from uh, string theory because of the scale invariance that's in the leading part. And that's the origin of all these no-go theorems. It says it's impossible to do at the classical level, at the leading, uh, leading order level. It is impossible and it's the scale invariance that stops it. So that means that um, 
in order to get the sitter space, you have to include features, including the corrections. And so that's why they're harder to get normally. And they're normally fairly involved models because you're needing to include these corrections to the leading potential to, to develop a potential that has an inflating minimum. But the scale invariant still has uh, information in it because the corrections, as I've argued, although they don't scale the same way as the leading part of the action, they scale in a specific way. And so the, the fact that they scale is telling you that there's a, there's a structure in the potential that has uh, observational implications. And I'm about to argue that those implications are actually fantastically successful. <clears throat> so what people normally say when they're talking about inflation, <coughs> excuse me, the way these, these uh, various issues of the low energy limit and what controls how high energies that contribute to, uh, to change inflation in the context of inflationary models, they come in uh, from the question as the question of why is it that the infoton is light? If the infoton is not lighter than the Hubble scale, and the Hubble scale is a very small scale because it's Planck suppressed compared to the other scales in the potential, then uh, the, the infoton will not roll around and give you the dynamics you need for inflation. So you need to have a very light scalar field, at least one. And you also need to have control over uh, quantum fluctuations because even if you don't believe inflation is true, all the proposals that are out there for the explaining the primordial fluctuations seen in the CMB, they all rely on, on quantum fluctuations turning into classical fluctuations uh, in the early universe. Inflation does it, but, but uh, the bouncing models also use that mechanism. And so there's always an issue of control over the, uh, the perturbative expansion, and which is in partly the low energy expansion, which is what's controlling loops in the gravitational context. So in, in any inflationary story, you're interested in understanding how corrections to your story are, um, come in because that's to do with the robustness of your predictions. And, and, there's, and, and people kind of understand um, that where people take that observation normally is to say that you're looking for a symmetry which, which kind of protects the size of the, the potential. You've got to, you have to have a very shallow potential to have an infoton be light. But the question is, why do quantum corrections keep it light? And a very natural way in which you could have that happen uh, is suggested by what happens for pions. That those are light because they are Goldstone bosons. And if the symmetry were exact, there would, the potential would be constant. And so that means that any corrections to the potential have to be suppressed by the small symmetry breaking parameter. So clip. And that suggests these kinds of act. Sorry, uh, question? Yeah. So this A can be treated as cosmological constant as well, capital A. Yes, in the sense that I'm. In, 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 re in reality, it would depend on all these other moduli that are being stabilized at some place in the potential. But if you're only looking at how the low energy fields vary, effectively, it's, it's looking like a cosmological constant. Yeah. That's right. So in these models, the hard thing to get is A. <laughs> you know, when you're actually trying to build these models from string compactations, the B term is actually pretty easy to get because if you, as soon as you have a, a Goldstone boson, and, and again, these Goldstone bosons are all over the place in string vacua, then you're, you're, you typically will always get a, a, a oscillatory potential. It's the constant that's the hard thing to get in these inflation models. So this models. cosine term is basically kind of a non perturbative effect. It depends on the model. Yeah, it usually is in the sense that if you're, the way that these models normally arise is a, as an axion where there's some sort of a, uh, an anomaly in a, in a, in a global symmetry. You know, there's, it's, an ax, it's, it's, it's often true that these axions are arising because you had higher dimensional anti-symmetric tensor gauge potentials. And so if you shift those by harmonic form, that looks like an accidental global symmetry at low energies. You know, in principle, there are no, uh, there are no global symmetries from the, in string theory, but this is effectively one uh, at low energies. And, and uh, those shift symmetries are broken by uh, things that are either non-perturbative in the world sheet. So it could be that the string is wrapping around some, cy some cycle, which is a big cycle, but they could be perturbative in string couplings. Or it could also be true that they, are non-perturbative in the string coupling, so that there's some sort of an anomaly thing going on, like for QCD. Uh, either of those things can happen. <clears throat> so the details of, of whether it's non-perturbative in the string coupling depends on a little bit on, on, on how you set it up. <clears throat> but any potential of this form will uh, generically, be, it'll be self-consistent that, that if you make A and B small, as you typically need to, compared to the basic scales in order to get inflation, then the corrections will leave it small because the symmetry will tend to produce the corrections to B tend to be proportional to the small symmetry breaking parameter. And so that keeps the, the, the infoton small, the light. And there is one more question. This F is basically the 
axion decay constant. But some I have seen in some literature people consider this A also some time dependent or something like that. You mean capital A here? No, 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 no. A by F. This F. The F. Yes. Right. Yeah. So, so it'll be that's the, that those things are true. So 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 it's at face value. What happens is that uh, let me show the next slide here. So, so for inflation uh, to work, F has to be very large compared to the Planck scale. Uh, and the way F arises in these models is that there'll be, you know, because there's no parameters in the problem, really it's some field. And so it's true that, that if the field that you've stabilized that, 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 appear, that contributes to F, if it hasn't been stabilized very uh, solidly, then it could be free to float around and then it might be a function of time. It depends on, on the potential you've, you've set up. And if you make the potential for the fields in F very steep, then it'll be it'll be locked down and f will be a constant. But if it's a shallow potential, then it'll roll around. And so so there's a lot of kind of ways you can go with this. But but even in the simplest examples where f is a constant, uh, one of the things is that the size of f is also tends to be given to you. It tends to like to be the string scale, which is normally smaller than the Planck scale. So one of the things that makes these models hard to get uh, these particular kinds of models hard to get uh, in in string models is is that the value for f that you're led to tends to be wrong because it wants to be smaller than the Planck mass rather than bigger than the Planck mass. It's also true that these models are not the best description of the data because uh, you know, we now know enough about the tensor modes and the slow roll parameters that uh, we know that uh, if you go to the Planck uh, data, which is what I'm showing you here, if you're, the vertical axis is a tensor to scalar ratio, which is consistent with zero basically. And the, uh, the right hand, the, the horizontal axis is the tilts of the scalar spectrum. And then this, this blob here is, the, is where the observations prefer you to be. It's this purple smear is what the uh, cosine potentials tend to give you. And so it's not, you know, it depends on how, how, how you wouldn't say they're ruled out yet, but they're kind of not, the, they're not kind of a, in the sweet spot of the data. I'm, I'm emphasizing that because I'm going to show you a class of models which are just love, just love this data. Uh, so there's, the, you know, the people rightly have focused on these, these, these models because they're, there are a natural way in which the symmetries of the high energy problem show up at low energies and do something nice for you in the inflationary models. But you have a sense that these models are fighting things a little bit because the, the data doesn't like them particularly. And it's true that the parameters that you get are not really in the sweet spot that you'd like them to be for inflation anyway. So you kind of really have a sense that you're trying to shoehorn the theory into a place where it'll describe inflation rather than it wanting to be there. But the same thing is not true for scale invariants. So the thing is that Goldstone bosons are generically light and trigonometric potentials are what you get if you have a, a, an internal symmetry that's been broken. But there's nothing that says that you have to be doing, uh, breaking an internal symmetry. And in fact, I've been arguing that scale invariances are gonna be generic to these low energy limits. There should also be Goldstone bosons for scale invariants. And the same argument that says that the potential is a, is a, a complex exponential for a, in a trigonometric uh, internal symmetry, a compact symmetry, the same argument says that for Goldstone boson for uh, the potential for Goldstone boson, the pseudo Goldstone boson for scaling grants breaking will be an exponential potential. And so the kind of generic thing you're led to instead of the, the cosines for them is this. And this kind of potential actually is an enormous, it's, 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 it's the best description we have for inflationary models of inflationary data. There's a lot of nice things here. The, the scale F that, that uh, you get predicted for these scale transformations, these fields are all the ones you're tracking are the moduli that came from the compactations. They all came from the metric. So they like to have the same normalization as the metric. And so they naturally have F at the Planck scale because that's the, that's, they're coming from the Einstein term. Um, they, if you look at this, uh, the, another nice feature of this potential is that the second derivative and the first derivative is small. It doesn't matter how big capital A and capital B are. As long as little a is bigger than little, the little f, these potentials are always going to have a very small slow, slow roll parameters because the derivatives are suppressed by the exponential. As long as what's happening is that as long as a is capital A is dominating, then the slope is small regardless of the value of, of uh, capital A and capital B. As long as little a is big enough, then you're always going to be in a slow roll region. You might worry: Are you allowed to have the field a be big? And again, that's also easy to get to, to have work in string theory. People often say that you can't get large field values in string theory, but that's actually, this is a counterexample to that. Uh, a could be the radius of an extra dimension. And if you translate what A being larger than M Planck means in terms of the underlying size of the extra dimensions and the string scale, 
the regime where A is bigger than F is the regime where the radius of the extra dimension is big compared to the string length. And that's the regime where you believe the supergravity field theory in the first place. So, so you actually only, the, the regime in which you can derive these potentials is always in the regime where this uh, A is big compared to F. And so there's no problem getting the parameters in the, in the right region. There's no tuning involved in these parameters to get the potential to be flat. But even better, this class of models are the yellow lines here. This, the, it's the ones that this is vertical class of models. They've come to be called, and now people call these the alpha attractors, which is just a fancy rediscovering of the, <coughs> of the exponential potential. It's another way of saying the same thing. <coughs> so these models were predicted back in, in you know, 2001 or 2003 as being good models that are kind of generic coming out of string theory. And they've found to be really, really, really good models that they, depending on the, what the value of F is, you could be anywhere along this line. And down here is the sweet spot. And in particular, the models that people talk about, the Starobinsky model, the, the Higgs inflation model, they're all really, when you get them, you write them down in terms of the Einstein frame, they all have this exponential potential form. So what you're really testing in these things is the fact that those models all work really well is really the statement that the exponential potential is just a really, really, really nail the data. <clears throat> sorry, please. Final thing is that, sorry? Oh, can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. So uh, how do I reconcile your statement that uh, uh, there is no tuning required to get this potential to be flat with uh, what you mentioned earlier, namely that uh, in general, these scaling symmetries that uh, scale the action up to an overall factor uh, are not going to be preserved by quantum corrections. Well, they're consistent. It, it, you know, I should say, I should say uh, I'll first answer your question, then I'll, I'll come back to the, 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 the I don't want to have the impression be left that these are easy potentials to get. So that you have to arrange things. And so there is an arrangement that has to happen, but it's not the one that you normally worry about. So, so the statement about the, so for your specific question, the way this would work is that the um, scale invariance would normally say that both capital A and capital B have to vanish. And so what happens is that the, uh, you, so what's hard in these models is to get capital A basically. Uh, as soon as you, as soon as you uh, include any kind of correction at all, so an alpha prime correction or a string loop correction, you always get these exponentials because uh, as I showed in the earlier slides, the, all those things are, are those are terms in the, in the Lagrangian that scale in a specific way, but differently than the leading term of the action. And so what happens is that they tend to want to scale in a specific way. And that's kind of why you're getting these exponentials. That, is that the way these things will come to you is that the, say the radius of an extra dimension will turn out to be e to the a over f, uh, it turns out. That if you, if you look at the canonically normalized variable, if you take the radius of the extra dimension and you go to the kinetic term coming from the Einstein term, it's the log of the radius, which is the canonical field. And that's kind of why A is appearing as an exponential. But you should really think of this E to the minus A over F as being one over radius to some power. And it's just generic that when you do these corrections, you get corrections to the potential, which are going like one over the radius because the radius is large compared to the string scale. And that's the expansion you're doing in the alpha prime expansion. So it's really generic to get terms like the B E to the minus A F. The thing that's hard to get is, is to get the potential. The, the generic thing that you get is that a, you get a potential where everybody runs away and there's no... Uh, you don't get hung up at any point where the potential wants to be constant. And to have that work, you have to kind of arrange things more carefully. You have to uh, find the potential for these fields that are not stabilized or that, that are stabilized. And you have to make it steep enough that they get trapped in some sort of a minimum. And then uh, this A is then it, what was really a, a more complicated function of these other variables I'm calling A. And I'm calling it A just because they're not moving much as, these, uh, as this uh, impliton rolls. So, so the, the, the narrow way in which I'm saying that these are, people normally talk about the, um, the eta problem in inflationary models. And what they mean is that if, I had ten, if I'd written a quadratic potential, I'd have to dial the coefficient of the phi squared term in a quadratic potential to be parametrically really small in order to get inflation to work. And so my statement I'm making here is that you don't have to do, dial the parameters here, that capital A and capital B could be a generic size. Capital F can be a generic Planck size. And the smallness of the slow roll parameters is all about where little a, the field is sitting, and nothing to do with how you, do you dial the parameters in the, in the potential. That's my, my, my precise statement about the not, no need to tune parameters. I the tuning is in the construction uh, that allows you to find a range where the fields are hung up in some potential. That's a very complicated thing to do. That's why it's, they're so hard to get. Um, because the potential, you're, you're working at the corrected level of potential, which is kind of a complicated thing to calculate in the first place. And so it's, uh, 
So the message is it's not easy to do. <laughs> so there's a, there's a sense in which it's a, it does have a Rube Goldberg feel to it, but the traditional, you have to tune the potentials of the parameters is not a problem. Okay, thanks. The last thought here is, is that um, one thing about this exponential potential is that if you take the first derivative, it goes like an exponential. The second derivative also goes like an exponential, but this, the first slow roll parameter is actually the first derivative potential squared. And the second slow roll parameter is the second derivative potential. So that means that the first slow roll parameter is actually parametrically smaller than the second slow roll parameter in these class of models. That's the way it likes to be. It, it wants to be, the, the, if you're used to the, the notation epsilon and eta, eta wants to be order epsilon squared in these models just because of this exponential structure. And so if you kind of track down what that means, that means that the uh, R, which is uh, the, the scalar tensor ratio, is order epsilon. And that means it wants to be second order in eta and, and ns minus one, which is the thing that's been measured uh, in this regime where eta is large, is ns minus one is being controlled by eta basically. So, so the prediction you're generically led to here is that r is of, of the order of ns minus one squared. We know what this is. This predicts something like r is like 0 0.001. And so if you go back to the uh, observations, you know, the, the constraints are that, that uh, r is 0 0.005 or 06, depending on where you think that the, your confidence levels are. But this, this class of models, which is very well motivated theoretically, uh, better motivated than the Axion models, uh, is saying that you're likely to find something at the place where people will be looking in the next generation of experiments, which is an interesting observation as well. So I, I think that the, uh, the I'm, you know, as I close off here, the main message of the inflation is that I think that the people's instincts to look for uh, potentials which are controlled by, uh, the, 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 identifying the infoton as being a, a pseudo Golson boson is a good instinct. But there's two classes, but broadly speaking, there's two classes of pseudo Golson bosons. There's the ones for compact symmetries, which are the ones that people tend to explore. And there's the ones for non-compact symmetries, which are the ones that are basically scale invariances. And those are the ones that often come from supergravities because of these scale invariances that they're inheriting from higher energies. And because those are so generic, I think that, uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the potentials to which they lead are so, such a great description of the data, I think that's nature telling us something. And the message is that is these scale invariances we should be taking much more seriously because they seem to be doing what nature likes to see. And I think whether that's true in detail will depend on further exploration, but I, I think that an awful lot of attention has been spent on trigonometric potentials and the swampland. And this is a much better investment of time, I think, because it's uh, as well motivated, better motivated than swampland, and it seems to be much more successful experimentally. So to summarize, I'm trying to make a picture here, uh, make a case here that uh, people should be doing for ultraviolet completions of gravity what they do whenever they use effective field theories. But you really, you really learn something when you, you take, if you have a, a theory you think is right, maybe it's QCD, maybe it's a standard model, maybe it's your string theory. The informative thing to do <clears throat> is to compare the predictions of that theory to the uh, predictions of an effective theory that has the same symmetries and rough particle content as, as the full theory you're interested in. Because by comparing those two things, you get to compare the predictions that are robust. Those will be shared by any theory that has the same symmetry properties from those that, are the, that know about the details of the specific theory you're interested in. And those will be the ones that are not shared by the generic class of, uh, of effective theories that share the symmetry properties. And it's that comparison which is the informative one. And it's not really so informative to compare your, effect, your, your UV completion to all possible effective field theories. And I think it's that last thing is what people are, are doing when they think about the swampland. They're thinking that many effective theories are not giving me things I get from string theory, but those things also do not have the symmetries that string theory is telling you should be there. And so if you're interested in exploring perturbative string vacua, you should be comparing to the class of scale invariant effective field theories, which have a lot of remarkable properties. And those remarkable properties coming from the symmetry alone are the things that are making what seems to be rare, rare. So I would say that the explanation of the rareness of the sitter space and things like that is really to do with these accidental scale invariances and is not an evidence that, that there's any uh, problem with uh, uh, effective field theories having UV completions. So that, I think, to me, is the useful direction to explore. Uh, that's very much the way physics works everywhere else. And uh, it, 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 it takes you away from the, the problem with uh, the swampland is that once you assert that there are effective field theories that cannot be UV completed, the question is which ones? And that's led to a series of, of ongoing conjectures as to what those things might be. And it's not clear what the rules are anymore. 
Whereas I think a very traditional way of thinking about low energy limits is very informative in, uh, in low energy gravity and in particular in cosmology. So uh, I hope I've convinced you that that's true and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. So, Flip, can I ask you something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you did ask. Just uh, 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 one, uh, uh, yeah, like we have to thank uh, Cliff for giving such a, a nice uh, elaborative talk where he tried to uh, cover the whole spectrum of effective field theories and uh, tried to show how this is uh, cosmologically relevant uh, according to the present day uh, CMB observation, particularly if we, if you, if you are the believer of the inflationary paradigm and uh, yeah this, this was the 23rd talk and uh, thank you cliff for your uh, nice talk and it's a great pleasure to have you with us in this forum and thanks for your support so i i would request everybody to unmute yourself and give a clap for him Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Okay, now uh, this is the discussion session. So please ask as many questions as you want to ask, <laughs> Cliff. If I okay, a, you, yeah. you start. Yeah. Okay, Cliff, uh, the potential you finally showed in the fiber compactification in the Calabria model. Yeah, this capital A. Can do you know any model of compactification of string theory where A will be non-zero without bringing in either branch or oriented fold planes? No, all the ones I know involve those. Yeah, I know that that, that can be controversial. I think it's also true that even more than brains, uh, all the ones I know involve anti-brains as well, which I think is the controversial thing. Brain when I meant actually it meant anti brain yeah. That's I, I thought you might have done yeah yeah. Uh, you know I so there's there's a discussion going on as you know about yeah. uh, whether that's a problem. It which, is. And it's, it's it's good that there's it's good that discussion's happening. I can give yeah. you my take on it, which is that uh, I think that the um, I think that the the. I think probably strictly speaking, it's it's been inconclusive so far. I think that the uh, if you kind of if you kind of ask if you build a ten dimensional if you kind of really try and uh, that, that the, the people what people are focused on I think is is can you control all the approximations uh, from the microscopic point of view where you're lo really looking at the string construction in, in its UV complete uh, details yeah. and the question and because it's not a once you introduce the antibrains you're not close to a supersymmetric limit in the presence of the antibrain and so back reaction becomes more of a generic problem. That's, that's, that's certainly true. Well, the, uh, but what people take as evidence of there being a problem is usually they'll find some field which is diverging at the position of the brain, of the antibrain. And, uh, and the thing is, I think that that's not in itself a problem. What that really says is that your, your ability to, uh, in particular, sometimes what the, that field is sometimes the, the, the field that's controlling your approximations, like the dilaton or the volume or something. And and so um, what that really is saying is that you're you're leaving the domain. Why, 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 why you were saying this is diverging at the position of the observation? Yeah, that's a calculation. But did yeah. it? Polchesky had made the final call on that day, showing that it is not actually an instability. It is not actually diverging. I would say that yeah, that there's the, that the it's it, I I think I there's a, actually a broader take on this is that. Um, if you take any source, like you just forget string theory, if you just take a, a nucleus or something in an atom, oh, yeah, or you take, you take anything that's localized and you yeah. ask, if I extrapolate the fields on the outside in an effective field theory and ask, what do they do with the origin? Yeah. The answer yeah. is that they generically diverge there. So you know, the Coulomb field is the obvious kind of Coulomb simplest field. example. Oh, yeah. Coulomb field. So, so to me, it looked like that, that's a wrong point to look for instability in the configuration space because anything which has one by R potential, one by distance potential have that singularity. So, yes. but we are not really going to that. We can't really go. I Means our mechanism is such that we can't really reach the origin. 
we can't really reach the r equal to zero position. That's true. So, so if we take but, that philosophy, otherwise QVD is also nonsense theory, right? Everything is nonsense theory. It's part of the, no, I would, would say it's not nonsense. I would say that the, you know, the, the, that's something which I was involved in is that uh, you can actually take these tools that you can, you, that you effective field theory tools, and you can apply them to small compact sources. Yes. And, and we've done this actually for nuclei. And if you ask questions like, for example, um, uh, if I wanted to know how the finite size of the nucleus shifts the energy levels of an atom, let's say. Yeah. The way that that happens in, in, in detail in these effective theories is that the, you're replacing the effect of the nucleus by a point source with a bunch of effective operators that are localized at the source, which are capturing the, 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 the highest mo mo moments uh, that the, the operator has, uh, that the object has. And what happens is that the, um, the boundary condition that the, the external fields feel in the vicinity of the nucleus you can derive a, a, an equation for the boundary condition. Uh, you can derive that boundary condition from the effective action of the source. And, and it's only in the case that it's a point source with point charge for the Schrodinger problem, let's say, that you learn that the wave function is smooth at the origin. The generic situation is that uh, it's not smooth at the origin. Um, and, and then when, what's really happening is that you're learning what the integration constant, how the integration constants in your solution are learning about the fact that if you had really done the whole problem and you'd solved inside the nucleus, the solution that you're, you're matching onto on the outside is not exactly the one that would have been extrapolating to a smooth solution when you ignore the nucleus. But you can actually control the calculation so that the, the, um, the contributions of any effective operator can be controlled yeah. where you're never actually asking, you're never allowing yourself to get inside the nucleus where you, the singularity actually really happens. So you don't have to have a nonsensical uh, predictions in those cases. And so I think in the string case, people have not been thinking about it in that sophisticated way. And so what they really get to is a point where their calculations are breaking down. And then they say, well, probably that means that, they, that, that it doesn't make sense, but they don't really know. Yeah, that's, so, what, I okay. that's what I wanted to know from you. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. I would go farther than that and say that that, uh, that was part of why I said at the very beginning that uh, effective field theories are not a poor man's description. So the fact that the arguments for there being a de solution are coming from an effective field theory, I don't see that as a disadvantage. The, yes. the point of view that these people are taking is that um, you need to understand the microscopic constructions in order to justify the effective field theory. And at some level, that would be nice to have. But the absence of them doesn't, is not really a, a crisis for me if the effective field theory is capturing properly uh, other things. And so, so I think it's fair to say it's not, it's not settled, but I think it's also fair to say that there's not a lot of doubt that it's gonna work, <laughs> in my mind anyway, so. Yeah. No, for such a microscopic theory, possibly we need to learn how to do the quantization of membrane or any brain, et cetera, the fields living on the brain to quantize them in that, those, only then we can really learn that whether those boundary conditions we will impose to avoid the instability can come from those quantization. Otherwise, it is still a, a hand waving argument. That's what I, my, my, my belief is. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I think that's true. Yeah, okay. One thing I do know though is that if you take these, these tools that you, you use for nuclei and you apply them to D brains, for example, you can yeah. kind of ask, is it really true that string theory has, maybe, maybe, maybe string theory doesn't have, uh, isn't described by those effective field theories. It turns out that it actually works really well. If you take the effective field theory of a point D brain source, you can ask how do the couplings renormalize? And, and, and it's actually interesting because the, because the D brain is the fundamental thing, what happens is that they don't renormalize, that the, that the uh, what, what would have been a renormalization process in a nucleus turns out to be just something which doesn't renormalize anymore at high, at high scales. And, and what the effective theory tells you is, the relationship between the Planck scale and the string scale and the string coupling, which is exactly the one that comes out of Polchinski's book. So, yeah. so it's, it's, I think there's lots of evidence that these tools will work in string theory, but I think yeah. it's true that they have not been uh, successfully used in the anti-brain case. And then there's lots of reasons why that's hard. And so. so I have a broader question about these uh, effective theories with uh, scaling symmetries. Um, so I was wondering what happens if you start with a theory that has this scaling symmetry and uh, you're interested uh, rather than in uh, low energy fluctuations around the vacuum, uh, but let's say you're interested in fluctuations around some uh, finite density state or finite temperature state. So you would expect that long wavelengths 
to have a, a, the appropriate description to be somehow hydrodynamics, would you expect to see any remnants of the scaling symmetry in the hydro theory? I don't know, in the equation of state? Or, uh, yeah, how, how would this uh, uh, export to finite density or finite temperature state? Have you thought about it? That's a good question. I, I haven't, uh, I imagine it, it depends a little bit on the, on the relative scales, right? That if you, if you have, say, a chemical potential, uh, you know, is that something which is intrinsically breaking the scale invariance, or is there a scale invariance breaking happening, uh, you know, at, at, at a larger scale or a smaller scale than the than the than the, the one that's setting the scale of your density? Mm -hmm. And so, I, I I actually don't know a clean answer. I wouldn't be surprised that if you can get to a region where it's a very scale invariant uh, fluid. This is my granddaughter. <laughs> hi. <laughs> you gonna say hi, Maya? <laughs> So I, I, I suspect that it's uh, that it's true that the um, that you could say something, and, and the fact that you often get uh, these these power law uh, equations of motion might have a scale invariance understanding, but I haven't thought it through, so I don't really know. I see. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions from the other participants? Please ask. If not, then I will ask question. <laughs> okay, so I just uh, want to, it's not a question rather than a comment. So like here uh, you gave examples of different uh, super gravity theories, which uh, and told how that can be treated as uh, within the framework of effective field theory. But like yeah. there is another approach which I uh, better to call it uh, the bottom up approach of effective field theory, which is, uh, uh, I don't know if they bother about the UV completion or not, but it is like, uh, like uh, uh, you know that uh, it's uh, the formalism given by Paolo Premelini, Giard Kaplan and all. So uh, there people used to uh, break the uh, diffeomorphism or time diffeomorphism symmetry and uh, treat the whole problem as like generating goldstone bozo. Right. Yeah. So uh, you, do, you want to make some comment on that? What are the prospects? Oh. Yeah, I think that's a good, you know, that's a, it's a kind of, um, there's kind of several levels of question in cosmology. And that I think is a very good approach to one of the questions. So, so the, so that you know, given that you're looking for fluctuations around uh, some slow, some rolling trajectory, then I think they're right that that, that it's uh, their their way of organizing. If you have only one field, you know, so if you only have one clock, then a, a very efficient way to organize the kinds of operators you can get in an expansion around a near to sitter limit uh, is is captured by what they say. You know, I think that they're they're right that that's a good way to organize things. And if you're in the business of measuring those things, that's actually useful to know that the class of parameters you need to think about is not arbitrarily large. Um, I think it's true also, though, that there are some time-dependent problems. You know, sometimes that, that theory is very successful. People call it the theory, effective field theory of inflation. Whereas I think there's, there's, there are many low energy questions you can ask in inflation that that will not answer. And one of them would be, um, you know, if you, if you have a, how do you find what the trajectory is in the first place that you're that you're fluctuating around, and and that's the kind of thing where you'd need to know. That's the kind of thing that you're often doing with these string models is that you 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 think you have uh, the energetics of various scalar field configurations, and you want to know, given some initial condition, how does it, how does something roll, and and then after you've done that, you'd be interested in what the fluctuations are, which is what this the Chung et al. effective theory would describe, and that that question of of what the solutions are is something which uh, you can't access within their formalism. Uh, but it's, uh, that's fine because you know, that's, that's not aimed at that formalism. But there are things that you can certainly say uh, about effective field theory that, and the effective field theory is playing an important role in controlling um, the, 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 as a particle physicist, you know, people often tend not to think about uh, time dependent backgrounds in effective theories because it sounds contradictory because normally in effective theory, you're, you're imagining that um, you're separating low energy states from high energy states, but you're assuming that energy is conserved. And so if you have a time dependent background, you're gonna break the time translation variance. And so you're gonna lose the conservation of energy that that relies on. 
And so there's sometimes in particle physics, you get this attitude that you can't use effective field theories in time dependent contexts. And I think that the understanding of that is not, uh, you need to go outside the Chung Adel. You can say some things about it in Chung Adel's uh, Lagrangian, but, but it's, you have to uh, work in this more general framework where you can really even take effective field theories and even there's no reason why you can't think about time dependent problems, but you have to be working within the adiabatic limit in order to use effective field theory techniques. And, uh, Sorry? Uh, yeah, I can understand. Like, uh, next point is related to your recent uh, few works, which is based on the open quantum systems, where you are trying yes. to understand the effective field theories as well. Yeah. Yes. So can you comment on this, please? Because we have a lot of interest on that. Oh, yeah. I, that, I, that's almost a talk I gave. I wasn't sure which talk to give, and that would be another one to give. I, I'm very interested in that still, and in, in that uh, I think that um, actually both both this this talk I did give you and that that talk the, the the lesson there is that I think that there are a lot of tools in low energy limits that we're not using in gravity which we should be using because they're a lot of the problems we're hitting they've people have hit before, and in that open effective field theory story I think the the generic problem of perturbative methods failing at late times which you see in cosmology with the secular growth problems and the infrared problems, uh, those are all, and also information loss in particular, there's, 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 there's potentially, we're asking very late time questions. And the puzzle is that we're doing it within a framework that we think we, where we should be able to have control over all our calculations because we think we're within the regime of the of validity of the effective theory. And, and that's because maybe we think the Hubble scale is small or we think that the curvatures are small. And the message of the open effective field theory story is that that's actually not sufficient, that having small couplings is not good enough because at late times, there's always a time after which small coupling expansion breaks down. Just because you know, e to the i h t, doesn't matter how small h is, there's a t for which you can't, you can't expand it anymore. You have to really think of it as an exponential. But the, um, the, the, the tools, that does not mean you cannot say anything about late times. And the thing is the tools for extracting that are, are what these open effective field theories are capturing. And they're just really rephrasing what people do in optics already, because geometrical optics is a regime where all this is happening too. Any, any, any one photon interacts very weakly with any one atom, but if, as soon as everybody refracts or reflects, then your, your perturbation theory is a terrible description of that. But you can still say things about geometrical optics without completely solving QED exactly. So the tools that allow you to do that are the ones that we're trying to uh, explore for black holes and for cosmology. And in cosmology, I'm relatively confident now that, that they actually capture what people already know. So that the, they seem to lead to stochastic inflation, <clears throat> but with correction. So it, says it, it allows you to do a systematic corrections around the stochastic inflation limit. And I think it's those corrections which have not been explored very systematically on the cosmology side yet. Although I think um, some of the work in, in uh, like Vincent Venin He's uh, where they're they're kind of getting more systematic, and I think Starbinsky also is involved. They're calculating the uh, uh, the back reaction of stochastic inflation on the metric, and uh, I think that we are probably we're very close to having a, a statement, a systematic statement as to how you order by order uh, build out from the stochastic limit and control late times in cosmology. And I suspect a similar statement is is is, is available for black holes but I don't know what it is. And I don't know if it's gonna be relevant to information loss problems. It might not be, but it, uh, I, all the evidence in our calculations that we've done so far is that there is a late time issue for black holes, just like there is in cosmology. It, it just, it, you don't see it so often because there's fewer calculations because there's less symmetry. So people have been less explicit, but whenever you actually look for it, it seems to be there. And there's, the tools seem to work there too. But in all the examples I know, the, what happens is that they, those tools tell you that the, the rate with which you lose coherence is different from the naive rate, but it's still there. And so it's probably true that at late times, the consequences of losing coherence are still gonna be there. And so then the issues of information loss are probably still not, is not gonna go away. But I don't know for sure. I, I, to me, it's kind of one of those things that I have a hard time understanding the whole discussion until I can understand that there was a controlled approximation going on. And it's not completely clear there has been one at those late times. One more thing maybe like uh, uh, in this case of, uh, in the case of uh, open uh, effective field theories, one thing I just want to know that uh, how people address the issue of the asymmetrics in the flat space 
because it is non-unitary. Yeah, it might not be well described by an S matrix. It's uh, it really true. It's true that it, it lends itself to a language which is not the one that we come from in particle physics. So it's, it doesn't come as a, even in terms of effective Hamiltonians, it doesn't really lend itself to that. Uh, so it's more of a, it's more of a, because in cosmology, you could also say that the S matrix description is not so useful, but you, but the evolution of states, you can still describe in terms of an effective Hamiltonian and that kind of thing. <clears throat> but the, I think the lesson in the open systems is that uh, even that could fail because because you know you get these phenomena like uh, decoherence or thermalization, where pure states are going to mixed states that you'll never get for any effective Hamiltonian, and and so having something that's broad enough to capture that is what the goal is. And 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 some of these other questions are some of the interesting things that are happening in black holes and cosmology don't require that level of framework of of, of that broad, broader framework because they might be capturable in terms of effective Hamiltonians, let's say, but um, I've lost this right of where I'm going now. <laughs> I guess the, the main message is that uh, I think that the the language in which you're 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 led to think about things is in terms of the evolution of the the reduced density matrix as opposed to the S matrix, and that's something which is uh, has a different domain of validity. So it may very well be true that S matrix methods are not working. Okay. Thank you. Any other question, please? ask we can't continue for so long if you have any question please ask uh, any people from the audience any comments i don't think so i think everybody is tired <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I don't blame you <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you. And thank you for the um, another speaker who is with you <laughs> right now. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you very much for, for tuning in. <laughs> yeah, thank it's, you for your talk. Yeah, it's thank really you. nice talk. Yeah. Thanks for coming. So stay safe, be healthy, and uh, we will get in touch. And uh, yeah, since we are doing some similar kind of stuffs, you may know that already, but yeah, yes. uh, uh, I will be in touch with you regarding this. Please, stuff. please do. And, and good, luck, good, good, good luck yourself with your personal situation and, and be safe, everybody. It's uh, yeah. funny times. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.